Just before we get to the video that you actually came here to watch, let me tell you about a new channel that I'm running called Decoding the Unknown. It's a show where I take a long, deep dive into some of the world's biggest mysteries, from what happened to the Roanoke colonists to the regular guy who found a listening device in his power strip. It's absolutely terrifying, and it's always a bit of a wild ride. You can find a link below. I hope to see you over there. The Cadogan teapot, a teapot that wasn't invented by William Cadogan, 1675-1726, the first Earl of Cadogan, and that wasn't used to brew tea, is, however, surprisingly clever. The design originated in China as an upside-down filling wine pot, or Dao Guan Hu, during the Qing Dynasty's Kangxi period, 1661-1722. The pots have no lids and are filled through a hole in the bottom. Incredibly, when it's turned right side up, no liquid leaks out and the wine can be poured from the spout as if no crazy sorcery is occurring. Of course, it's nothing magical. The pot doesn't leak as the hole at the base is not just a hole. It's actually the opening of a funnel. When upside down, the pot fills easily, provided you remember to cover the spout with your finger. When you turn it over, the wine falls to the bottom, and the opening of the funnel is left above the liquid, preventing any escape. Why they were designed like this remains a mystery. Some have suggested it was to keep away bugs, and while it would work like that, a lid seems like a much simpler option. There's also the possibility of it being some kind of anti-spill feature designed for use on the railway, but this is also unlikely to be true. The most plausible explanation for the complex design is simply that they were a curiosity used for entertaining guests. The novelty value is how the pots gained the Cadagan part of their name. In the early 19th century, Lord and Lady Cadagan bought one of the puzzle pots back to England to amuse their dinner party guests. Examples have been found worldwide in Japan, India, North Africa, and Peru, but as the Cadagans were the first English to own one, that's how the pots got their name. Also, how they came to be teapots is another mystery. Clearly, they'd be useless for brewing tea, as the pots can't be cleaned inside and the leaves would block the funnel and spout. Instead, the Cadagans would use them to hold hot water, which they'd then pour over the tea. One possibility for this switch from wine is that the pots would have been packed with tea to prevent breakages on their journey from China. When they were unpacked in England, the recipients thought that this indicated that they should be used together. The story of the Lidless Pots is now so closely linked with tea that the globe-shaped designs of the teapots we know today have even been a credited to the Cadagan teapot. Some have even gone so far as to suggest Europeans invented the teapot. However, this is yet another example of the West falsely claiming credit. Four historic texts reveal that the first Yixing teapots were made in China around 1500 AD, 300 years before the Cadagans first demonstrated theirs to their mystified guests. The misconception stems from the fact that although China were the first to brew and drink tea, early methods didn't require a teapot. Instead, the tea was formed into hard blocks and pieces were broken off for brewing in open pans. Later, powdered tea was invented and it would be whisked to form a paste directly in the cups. However, when loose leaf tea gained popularity during the Ming Dynasty, a new brewing method was needed and pots took off. The purple and red clay Yixing teapots invented in that period are still regarded as the best way to make tea. They have the unique ability to absorb the flavors of each brewing, and provided they were used to only make one variety of tea, they'd become seasoned, increasing the depth of flavor with each use. As tea became more popular in Europe, Europeans needed a way to make their own teapots. They lacked the perfect clay of Yixing, but they did realize that porcelain, developed by China in the 7th century, could be a good alternative. Unfortunately, they just couldn't figure out how to make it, and only succeeded in creating fragile, soft paste varieties that exploded when filled with boiling water. Certainly a bit of an issue for a teapot. Korea developed their own harder porcelain in the 14th century, and Japan managed it in the 17th, but it wasn't until the 18th century that German innovator Johann Bartger of Meissen had an industry breakthrough and managed to develop hard paste porcelain for Europe. Finally, Brits could brew a cuppa without exploding pots and third-degree burns. Another dubiously named but cunningly designed teapot is the Assassin's Teapot, so called because its unique structure gives it the ability to pour two completely different drinks without onlookers noticing. In theory, this would allow you to serve up a poisoned beverage and reassure your victim that it was safe by drinking from the same pot. If they were to look inside the pot, however, they'd see that it has two chambers and that the spout is also divided in two. Each chamber can be filled with a different liquid, and the server can control which comes out by blocking a specific hole with their finger 
as they pour. It works because atmospheric pressure and surface tension can hold the liquid in place, providing air has no separate way in. You see, for the liquid to get out, air needs to get in, so if you block the whole of one chamber, only drink in the other chamber will come out. So why did we say that it was dubiously named? Well, firstly, as far as we know, it's never been used to assassinate anyone. Clearly, it's possible that many murderers have used the method and gotten away with it. However, the whole system has a few giveaways. For starters, the teapots don't look like ordinary teapots, and your victim suspicions may be raised when you cover the top hole as you pour. Secondly, one quick glimpse down the spout would allow your victims to see that it was divided in two. Finally, any well-mannered murderer knows that etiquette dictates that you always pour your companion's drink before you pour your own. If theirs was poisoned, this would leave traces at the end of the spout, which could contaminate your own drink. It seems more likely that the assassin's teapot would be used as a party piece to astonish guests or perhaps to smuggle whiskey into your coffee while leaving others unspiked. However, the concept of poisoning someone with tea certainly isn't unheard of. Victorian serial killer Mary Ann Cotton, also known as the Black Widow, used arsenic mixed in a teapot to murder 21 people for insurance payouts. This included three of her husbands and 11 of her children. When she was finally apprehended after 10 years of her family members dying suddenly and in gastric distress, her sentence was death by hanging. Curiously, the rope was rigged too short, and instead of a quick end by broken neck, she suffered a slow strangulation. For those interested in seeing a real assassin's teapot, it's possible to see the small black Wedgwood pot she used at the Beamish Museum in County Durham. More recently, Russian assassins used a teapot to murder Russian defector Alexander Litvinenko. He died in 2006 after meeting with two former KGB agents, Dmitry Kovtun and Andrei Legovoy. They, or a waiter under their instructions, had laced a teapot with polonium-210, an extremely radioactive substance. Just one microgram is enough to kill an adult. Litvinenko requested a clean cup, suspecting that they wanted him dead. Unfortunately, as it was the teapot that was poisoned, he still received a lethal dose and died 23 days later. Remarkably, it took the police six weeks to recover and test the teapot. When they finally did, they discovered that it was still radioactive and had been used to serve tea to hundreds of guests, the implications of which we'll never know. Another vessel that uses a similar method to the assassin's teapot was the inexhaustible bottle. It went beyond tea parties and took the clever design to the stage as magic. The illusion was performed by many magicians during the 17th century under various names, such as Any Drink Called For, Satan's Barman, The Bottle of Sobriety and Inebriety, and The Obliging Tea Kettle. The trick usually involves asking members of the audience to name any drink, and the magician would use the bottle to produce whatever they asked for. Just like with the assassin's teapot, the insides of the bottle were divided into sections that were filled with different liquids. Each had a small hole on the base or side of the bottle, and the magician could choose which one to unblock to allow the chosen drink to flow out. The trick was often taken one step further by performing the endless pour. Special glasses were used that were mostly glass and held only a small amount of liquid. They let the magician convince his audience that the bottle was truly inexhaustible. The use of physics and hydrostatics to trick the unsuspecting dates back much further than you'd expect. One famous trick, or moral lesson, is credited to the Greek mathematician and philosopher Pythagoras. He's said to have invented a cup that would teach its users about greed. On first sight, it looks like a normal drinking cup, and it can be used as one, provided you don't help yourself to too much wine. The trick is in the central column that sticks up from the bowl of the cup. It contains a pipe and a chamber. The level of wine in your cup stays below the level of the chamber, you'll be fine and you can drink happily. But if you fill your glass too high, the liquid will spill into the chamber, travel through a pipe, and spill out of the bottom of the cup and end up all over you. Worse than that, the hydrostatic pressure will create a siphon, so the entire cup will empty, and you'll end up humiliated and wineless. While Pythagoras could be said to be humiliating his guests with honorable intentions by teaching them to accept that they have not to succumb to greed, other inventors were just in it for the laughs. One such invention was the puzzle jug. The earliest example dates back to the 12th century, but they didn't hit peak popularity until the 18th. The jug's founder, often inscribed with instructions such as, Here, gentlemen, come try your skill. I'll hold a wager, if you will, that you don't drink this liquor all without you spill and let some fall. Another one read, Within this 
drug, there is good liquor. It is fit for parson or for vicar. But how to drink and not to spill will test the utmost of your skill. Hosts would challenge their friends to drink from the drug without spilling any liquid. The trick is that the neck of the drug was lined with holes and was impossible to pour the conventional way. Only the most cunning would figure out that the handle was hollow and would act as a straw, allowing the contestant to suck the liquid through the spout. Of course, drinking pranks didn't end there. Without YouTube and Netflix, people had to get their kicks somewhere, and laughing at your friends getting covered in wine was as good a pastime as any. So the fuddling cup was invented around the 15th century. It was a drinking vessel made up of three cups joined together by tubes. As with the puzzle jug, the challenge was to drink it without spilling, which could only be achieved if you drank from each cup in the right order. The order was impossible to guess, and so much wine was spilled that to fuddle literally means to make foolish by drink, and the fuddling cup certainly lived up to its name, unlike the assassin's teapot. All went quiet in drinking prank circles until the 19th century, when Danish-American inventor S.S. Adams decided the joke had been left long enough to be funny again and invented the dribble cup. As you might be able to guess, it was a trick cup with hidden holes that would cause liquid to dribble out as you tried to drink. It was sold for 49 cents and marketed with the tagline, make your drinking friends drool with the promise of roaring laughs every time. We'll have to take his word on that one.